Good evening, and welcome to the August 2018 edition of League of Women Voters Presents, the monthly public affairs show about issues important to Columbia, Mid-Missouri, and beyond. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the justice system and a, um, an ongoing important issue in the justice uh, system, which is uh, jail overcrowding or how we're going to deal with, um, with the rising number of inmates in this country and locally. And uh, we have a terrific guest who is uh, very knowledgeable and has spent uh, a fair amount of time uh, dealing with this problem every day and also uh, in other aspects as well in terms of being uh, looking at it from a uh, very solutions-oriented kind of approach, and that is Judge Gary Oxenhandler. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And um, I thought maybe we could just start kind of um, maybe not at the beginning, but at what you're holding in your hand, and that would give us a good uh, entry point into this. Well, in 2017, I completed a jail study for the county, for Boone County, uh, in late 2016, I was contacted by the commission. Our numbers in the jail were getting very high, and we can only put so many people in the Boone County Jail, and when we're filled up, we go to surrounding counties, and it costs to do that. Uh, our numbers were up higher than they had been over a long period of time. In 2016, we exceeded the budget that was available, so that means we were dipping into other funds. The commission was concerned they asked me, I, had re I was on the bench from 2002 until uh, 2016, and I mandatorily retired, so they knew I had nothing to do. And <laughs> I had always been interested in uh, jail operations and controlling jail populations, and I, it, it uh, was a great job for me, and uh, I was pleased to be asked and pleased to, to do the work. And in uh, about four months later, in 2017, in April, uh, I completed the report, and uh, I've been answering questions about it since that time, so it's nice to be here to chat a little more. So, yeah, so that's more than a year you've been answering questions. So why don't we talk a little bit about what you found and, and kind of um, maybe where that fits into what's next. You know, in some respects, what I found would be disappointing because there was no big answer here in Boone County. Uh, in Boone County, we've been paying attention to jail population for the past 30 years, and is we're pretty cutting edge here. So paying attention for 30 years, meaning? Meaning that, the, for, for example, uh, there's a, an organization that meets once a month up in the judge's uh, library, and it's uh, attended by the judges that do sentencing, the prosecutor, the public defender, private bar, the sheriff, the jail, the county commission, Reality House, hmm. uh, the city judge, uh, any, and I'm sure I'm missing the county clerk, the circuit clerk, excuse me, and we talk about jail population. And we also uh, produce a lot of statistics for people to review and chat about. And when you have that many eyes on the project that are on the, uh, the problem, it helps ameliorate the problem. So we've done a great job, and it's, it's interesting, that committee is an outgrowth of a task force that we, that I sat on in 2001, I believe, and uh, it, there was, the philosophy was bring everybody to the table that plays a role, that has a piece of the action in putting people in jail, and get them to talk with one another. And, as a, and it, we follow that, and that pattern and protocol has worked great here. And, and interestingly, I made a call right before I uh, came in this evening, and the jail population is down right now, hmm. considerably down. And basically, we can house an average of 23 prisoners a day out of county at about $40 a shot, and we can be within our budget. Now, the budget, and, and this may have changed in the past, it's not that I'm, I'm now on the outside of the tent. 
you know, <laughs> right. and so when I was in on the inside of the tent, I understood all of the numbers and these things may have changed. But there is one component of the funds for funding out of county housing is from Proposition L, which was a tax that went into effect many years ago, and it has a sl it has a balance in it, and that money that is not used for out of county housing goes for alternative sentencing courts, and so there's a fund that's been built up over the years because we've done a good job of administering those funds, but when 2016 came along, it was a bad year and we busted the budget probably to the tune of $200,000. And when that happens, that means that those potholes over on whatever don't get fixed. The money's gotta come from someplace. And, and we, we, we couldn't sustain that. Um, so when it was in some respects disappointing because there, no, there was no magic in what I found out. I mean, I made some recommendations of things to do, but there wasn't like, if you do this, this is going to, uh, you're going to reduce your numbers. Fascinatingly, and I just mentioned this, this to you a few moments ago, Randy, when I was doing my research, I came across an article that was written about the jail task force. And it was an article that said that the Boone County Jail Study Task Force Wednesday released its final report calling for dozens of changes in jail management. And recommendation number one was, the task force solution to the problem is simple, put fewer people in jail. And you and I laughed about that. That report's from 1981. We knew that back then. So really, the answer to controlling jail population is to put less people in jail. The solution to that is, is quite a bit more difficult. And over the years, we have matured that here. I can talk about that if that's of sure. interest. Well, I, I guess the idea is that if you, if you don't put 23 inmates out of county and you can s devote more resources to the alternative sentencing. Yes, that's correct. With regard to uh, out of county housing, that is correct. But then that money goes to try to build the momentum to put fewer people in jail. Well, it's, self, it's a self-feeding system. It's a good thing. We now know the alternative sentencing courts are very important, and we have uh, our drug court, our mental health court, our DWI court, our veterans court. We run a domestic violence docket and things like that, and I would assume that there's going to be even greater expansion because one of the things that's going on right now is it is, is an outgrowth of the alternative sentencing courts, and that is is that we've come to recognize that gals until they're about 24 and guys till they're about 25, their brains aren't farmed sufficiently where that part of the brain that says, you know, Randy, that's not such a good idea, we don't listen to it. And, and so what we're talking about doing, and in fact are doing, is raising the age of the juvenile court mm. from 17 to 18. Some say that should be 21, and that may be driven more fiscally than otherwise. But so that's going to really, uh, juvenile courts really are first alternative sentencing court when we think about it. And is that a local decision? That's or? statewide. Statewide. So, so it's and now, when does that happen? Well, how does it happen? When? Oh, I believe it goes into effect. I'm pretty sure it's January 1. It could be August 28th. Okay, but I don't know that, but it's shortly. Soon. So that's going to, the, so the, the packet of people that may be going to uh, juvenile court should probably increase over the next few years. And it should go up higher. And, you know, there's even, there's some discussions about uh, having something like a juvenile court, but in adult court, mm -hmm. where it takes into account the age of a person when they commit an offense. Now, there are certain offenses that get committed, and, and you, you're not going to treat them in a, in a forgiving way, and that's just how it is. But if your jail is going to be filled up, uh, it should be filled up with those people that are being held pretrial those being held for felonies. And interestingly, when we built our jail in 1991, almost immediately it was overcrowded. They thought that was going to be the answer. And we looked at our jail population and we saw that there was a huge percentage, maybe 60 to 75 percent were misdemeanors. People that had misdemeanor convictions were in our jail. Now, if you go look at it, you're going to find it is completely unusual to even have one or two 
who are misdemeanors that are convicted. Wow. Now, there are always some people that will break the mold. And you go, this person doesn't get it, and we use, need to use whatever means we can to protect the public. But the real key is, and in the report, and I, I, uh, it's uh, then Chief Justice Patricia Breckinridge for Missouri saying under Missouri Constitution, an individual may be incarcerated before trial only when charged with a capital offense, when a danger to a crime victim, a witness, or the community, or a flight risk. All other persons are entitled to reasonable conditions of release prior to trial based on the particular circumstances of the case. And that, and, and we really have lost that, n not, not necessarily here in Boone County because we're a bad example of, of a bad example. We're a good example of a good example. Right. But country-wise, we, you know, we're just completely out of control. And because we're, we are a lock em up society and we've been that, good, bad, or indifferent, we like to put people in jail. And certainly there are some people that should be in jail if they're going to run or they're a threat. I mean, you know, it's, you know it when you see it. Um, but there's just been a broad stroke. And we, we know also, I mean, in terms of how we're looking at all this, another area that we're looking at is the collateral consequences of a conviction, which I sit on a Supreme Court commission right now, and we're looking at that. We just published a partial paper on that. And... Uh, if you or your readers are interested, there's a professor, uh, Michelle Alexander, who wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, which talks really about uh, the collateral consequences of a conviction. And when we think of collateral consequences, we say, well, you, you can't vote while you're on probation or you can never serve on a jury. But public housing, student loans, I mean, it's uh, to serve on a commission, uh, that have no connection. So a person who got a bad check felony charge 20 years ago, you know, they're never going to sit on a jury. Why can't they sit on an automobile case? And why shouldn't they be able to sit on any jury because lawyers and judges vet those people who have biases and prejudices and shouldn't sit on those. So it's, it's like and, and you can tell, you only have to get me rolling here. You know? <laughs> and so do that whenever I, when you, you've got a topic change on me. But to me, it's just fascinating what's going on. And we are putting too many people in jail. It isn't necessarily happening here in Boone County because we, we run a very tight ship. There are, you know, things that could be done to make things better, but um, there are little things. There are little adjustments. Well, and I think the idea about the the uh, alternative, the, you know, the alternative court sentencing, you know, the different courts that that has, we didn't always have those. Right. Those have kind late nineties. Late nineties, we put those in effect. So that was a, an attempt to address this problem. But, and and it's helped obviously. But it seems like you know you just did a this in last two thousand seventeen. Um, are you going to do this again in 2027? I mean, is this going to be, why, why can't we fix it? Well, you mean countrywide? Well, I, I would here, like to know both. Well, I mean, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of all of this, and I do a lot of work in this area with uh, uh, Rusty Antel, who's a, yep. a uh, private defense attorney, and he and I have been sort of churning along in this for the last 25 or 30 years. By the way, the jail population is down today out of county, or at least as of the, the numbers that were produced last week, uh, less five or less were out of county. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And you know, it's not bad to house out of county. There's multiple problems when you start thinking about building a jail besides the cost of building it, the cost of operating it, the inability to get people to work in the jail. It's not a pleasant job. There aren't a lot of jobs that people are engaged in where they might be spat upon in their work. And we don't pay a lot. Um, and in fact, we've had our own experience here in Boone County with inability to meet staffing requirements because I believe in about, it seems to me it's 2015, that we closed down one pod, one housing unit that held 40 detainees and had to house them out of county because we didn't have staff. Mm. And it takes a while to get up to speed on staff because we just don't hire anybody off the streets. We hire a pretty sophisticated group of people 
to be in these circumstances trying to make sure they have the right personalities and they're not going to be taken advantage of and they're you know they're people that can take responsibility so you you can't even staff it if you build it we're going to put people in it but we're not going to be able to staff it and that's a problem that they're happening having all over and then you talk about well the answer is let's privatize because there's lots of companies will come in and run your jail but you know um it's a real concern to have third parties take care of our citizens yeah. because they're driven by profit right in in boone county or hopefully in most counties they're not driven by profit and we've commenced to realize that these are our fellow citizens in our jail mm -hmm. and we got to treat them with respect we can be mad at them and we can be very upset with them and i know that's not the right word to use if you're a victim it's more than that um, but we should only have those people in there that are a real threat to the community. Otherwise, we should be getting people out as quickly as we can. So having housing out of county, it's okay. If we're under 23, which is within our budget, arguably, that's okay. Right. And you, and you, but it's really hard to find that number because even if you find and go, okay, we have to expand, you're going to fill it. If you build it, they will come. That is, that is just a fact. Everybody knows that. Right. Always has been right. the case. But it's, it's like, what happened in 2016? I mean, why, why does it? Why do we see these kind of ups and downs? Do you have, you know, you have a lot of experience sitting there, right? I think sending the, people to jail. Well, I'd say this. You know, we know little cycles. We know usually in June, when it, when June, July, August, when it starts to get hot, people are outside. They're interacting more and they fight more. People get hurt, but you know. That's not the case today. Here we are. It's August 14th, August 15th. August 15th. August 15th. See, I'm retired. I know. <laughs> they all blend together. <laughs> and, uh, but we're, we're under five. That's right. an incredible number. And then in around Christmas time, people are usually pretty calm, and your numbers usually go down. Mm. But that isn't always the case. And in 2016, you really couldn't point at anything. It wasn't like there was a big uptick, uptick in... Uh, gang activity or anything like that. It just happens. We do know this, and it's interesting, and I, I mention it here, is it sort of goes to your earlier comment, are we going to be doing this in 2027, is that you got to, you always have to be looking at this. You have to keep the pressure on the system. And we have uh, several organizations, the monthly meeting that I talked about, and we have an ongoing quarterly committee that Rusty Antel uh, chairs, and we have a mental health panel that meets either once a week or once every other week that Judge Schneider was in charge of to take a look at people with mental health because that's a, a big problem and trying to move those people through the system as quickly as possible. We also had the jail visitors, which I started on in the early 80s and was on for a long time, that is a, a, a panel of citizens who have nothing to do with the jails but inspect the jails and any incarceration facility on a quarterly basis and report back to everyone else. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep the pressure on. There is this effect which we've talked about and which I talk about here. It's the Hawthorne effect, which is, is that if you start paying attention to something, you usually have a good result of it for a period of time. And of course, we saw that as a result of this. We saw it as a result of the two past task force that we have uh, activated that when they're ongoing and there's publicity and the, everybody's talking your numbers go down it just has an impact so I'd say if we're still doing this in 2017 and we're under five and it's August 15th we're doing a heck of a job here right so, so it's we, it's okay right we haven't taken our eye off the ball we haven't taken and, and as soon as you do that your numbers are going to explode and, and that's happening all over Right, and that's the, so. Let's let's talk about that because you probably have had conversations with judges from other parts of the country that maybe are frustrated that you know how how their situations are are going because maybe maybe the community doesn't have the same kind of attention to detail that that we do in Columbia or a different judge, a judge who comes in with a different mentality. Uh, you know, say you have young judges that haven't been around and haven't had a lot of people before them, or elected judges in a small community, and how do they react to things? If the, if the number one citizen gets punched in the nose, do they treat 
that case differently. I mean, we're all subject to our personal and professional foibles, and we succumb to them. Um, you know, it, what's important in one community is not as important in another. If you're living in a farming community, a DWI to a farmer to take him off the streets during the harvest is a killer, and so you have muffler violations. In another community, if you got a DWI, you got a DWI. It doesn't make a difference who you are or what you've done. Everybody gets treated the same. And so the, the communities are all different all over the United States. And, and of course, uh, pretrial decisions, the most difficult decision that a judge makes is what do I do pretrial? When I don't have someone that's been convicted of anything, I have allegations that are made against them. How, how do I make a good decision here? Because if, if what concerns all judges is you have someone hypothetically that comes before you and they have a check charge, some, and you you make a decision, they're out on the street, and three months later they drive drunk. And there was, you're going to see the criticisms. And the criticisms are, if you put that person in jail, they wouldn't have driven drunk and they wouldn't have hurt somebody. Right. You know, and it's, you're right. You, you, people will not recommit crimes if you lock them up. But the fact of it is, the bold fact is, is that unless we get control of jail populations, they're not going to be filling potholes. And that's, and obviously I'm using that metaphorically, but that's where it comes back to everybody. And you go, it's like the magic 9% tax. You're going to get beyond that, you're going to have a real hard time convincing anybody of that. But is that is that something you have a sense that there is kind of people understand that connection? It it seems like uh, the putting people in in jail and you know uh, obviously you know a lot of African Americans are 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 uh, put in jail uh, and and they're a big part of the population. There's a lot of issues going on where there's not a connection, other than we just need to do that. And I don't care about the potholes, and I don't care about uh, race relations or anything. We just need to do this. It's absolutely correct. And, and I mean, we live in a, an incredible society right now. And there are, we hope that there are changes going on, but they aren't necessarily changes going on. And, you know, once again, I think that we're fairly enlightened in this area, the judiciary and the commission and all the people that participate in it. but. You know, there are circumstances which we don't catch, and I've seen them, and obviously we've all seen them, and they make us, I, I think in most instances, I will say, they make me sick. I can't, and I believe that it makes the judges here sick, but we're not, you know, Boone County is like a different world. When I was on the bench of 11 judges, nine were women. Hmm. I mean, like, where is that, that happening? Right. I mean, that is... Uh, I mean, just as an example of things that are different, um, good, bad, or indifferent, you know. But I mean, and I would say obviously, uh, good. good. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it is it's it's such a complicated problem. I think that the disconnect isn't as great as you might see because I people I think people understand that if our budget was three hundred thousand and we're paying five hundred thousand, where's that money coming from? Everybody sort of relates to taxes, and they're usually paying it more attention to that than they are the individual cases that they see. It's an interesting, I mean, but it's like you say, it depends where you live right. and, and, uh, and how well people, how well that, I think, how well that connection is made to, to explain the situation that if we do this, if we spend $100 million on a new jail, we can't spend, a hundred, you know, the opportunity cost and I, 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 I think sometimes we sort of get in a, in a bind because there's folks that don't want to make that connection for their own whatever reason. Absolutely. There's always, there's going to be a segment that says, lock them up. Lock them up if they write me a bad check. Lock them up if they hurt somebody. Lock them up if they have a multiple DWIs. And I would say, I'm not saying that you don't lock people up in those circumstances, but you've got to look at, at the history and feel comfortable with regard to that. And we have alternatives to locking up. Right. You know, we have now multiple GPS alternatives. 
and we can keep people in places or keep people away from places. We can monitor our, monitor whether or not they're consuming alcohol, and those things are getting more and more sophisticated, and we use a lot of it. In Boone County, we have an adult court services division, and we've had that for a long time because Frank Conley, who predates all of us and is gone now, back in the 80s, said, I'm going to develop this as the presiding judge. So, uh, you know, I, I spoke at the the commissioners of all the county governors for the state, or uh, the county commissioners, their uh, annual meeting about that exact issue. And they talked about our adult court services here, which is pretrial services by another name. Right. So I want to talk about what's next okay. with this. But first, but, so I've got to leave time for that. But um, isn't it just easier as a judge to lock people up? Yeah. So well, I would say this. It's easier to say that, but to suggest that's the machination, no. You know, it makes me sick to lock people up. It's and Even though we have a reasonable facility here, you know, um, our ability to lock people up, to take them away from their families, to take them away from their jobs, it's, a, it's terrible the havoc we wreak on their lives and irrevocably change them. And it's not suggesting that in, a, on, in our jails on a local level there are risks to people there, though people don't get better by staying in jail. Right. They get to be better criminals by staying in jail. But just think of how we, we devastate families and that's the plea for, you know, I mean, it, it is, uh, it certainly is appropriate in some circumstances, but when you look at, you know, Judge Breckinridge's admonition as to who just repeating the Constitution us, we've really got to think through it very carefully. And we have to do it fast. It doesn't help a person to leave them in jail for a month and finally get around to getting going, well, this person needs to be out. We should know that in just the shortest period of time because we're ruining their lives. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so what happens now with the report or what, what uh, you said there's no magic potion, but uh, what, what what's going to happen, if anything? Well, I think that the... The, you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of people, in, in fact, both on a, a local, a statewide, and on a national level have contacted me and we've talked to about, uh, talked about various things. You know, to give you an example, one of the recommendations that I made was on the week, or excuse me, on the monthly meeting that has all those people attend, there's no one that does budget. And hmm. so I, I said, the county auditor should be on that right. committee. Right. You know, that just makes sense. But, you know, it's it's like why, you know, Reality House, which is sort of our halfway house, uh, they weren't on in the early days, but they've been on for a long time. Or the municipal judge who adds to the jail population, he should be added. And so things like that, uh, nuances, trying to move things along faster than they have moved along. Um, you know, I think that the jail, I, we have this uh, mental health committee that Judge Snyder uh, heads up. I think that um, there should be one for the jail as a whole. We should be constantly looking at that. And, you know, in the old days, that's what we would do. Before we had the availability of all these statistics that tell us everything about everybody, um, we used to just go when the jail was high in population, we would we grab all the files up. Of course, you don't have files anymore. <laughs> and they bring them in to the office, and we'd go through them. And I, when I was presiding judge in oh, 2008 and 9, uh, I'd just send a missive to one of the judges and say, hey, look at this case. Now, it's their case. They get to do what they want to. And that is, in many respects, the beauty of the judici judicial system, that the judges are independent. And I can certainly move a judge from one courtroom to another if I'm the presiding judge, but I can't tell them how to run their courtroom. They're elected officials. Right. Sure. And they're independent. So it's it's sort of like the the, the court sitting in bank is sort of a uh, law firm in disarray where no one <laughs> has to pay attention and you sort of pay attention. And, you know, I think we're lucky because we've, we've got a great group of judges and this upcoming election is going to be really interesting too. Yeah, well, 
let's not get started. No, on no, that. no, 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 no. I meant just I was just speaking on a local level. There's a lot of uh, positions up for grabs, so it's and a lot of good people running. So it's it's fascinating time here. Yeah, I think we're lucky to have uh, to have people like you. We're lucky to have that monthly meeting. We're lucky to have uh, good folks that are running for elected office in Boone County. So, um, you know, so that's good, right? Right, and and we need to have more people. Uh, interested and hopefully you know by us chatting here it'll interest some people in in getting active because that's what it takes uh, uh, things happen when people stir the pot that's and in right. this instance you know we're looking you know we, we've been talking on a local level but on a, a national level you know the United States has five percent of the world population and 25 percent of the world prisoners how does that come to be and it, it, once again, it's a philosophical thing here in the in the United States. As wonderful and great and awesome of country as we live in, um, it's still somehow we got off the track on that. Right. And now we're paying for it. And as a result of that, and and once again, uh, the the new Jim Crow is a is a book to Good read. Book. It's just incredibly insightful. Yeah. Well, and, you know, trying to get back on track starts one step at a time, one community at a time. Right. And so it's, it's great to hear about all this. And, and I, I think we're out of time for this month. So okay. thank you very much, Judge Oxenham, for My coming. My pleasure. And uh, we'll see you next month.